few of these people are actually software developers. There's basically one, two, three, four, maybe five, five full-time development staff, um, various administrative staff, one person who runs our training program, and everyone else who you're looking at here is a physics, biophysics, chemistry, biochemistry uh, graduate student who is an active user of the code that the center produces. So the codes that we produce, uh, we try to use a variety of methods. Um, historically, we've been focused on straightforward molecular dynamics simulations, uh, but those have a limited length and time scale. So we also have more coarse-grained type interactions, Brownian dynamics, and we even have some relatively very recent work on uh, simulating entire cells using uh, reaction diffusion type equations. Um, this is the new lattice microbes simulation code, and that's entirely uh, a CUDA-based uh, enterprise. We simply cannot do that scale of simulation that fast on any other system. So that is entirely enabled by GPUs. Uh, what we're here to talk about today is, of course, NAMD. Uh, NAMD has done pretty well over the years. Uh, in 2002, we had a uh, Gordon Bell Award uh, for some simulations running not only on uh, the Lemieux system, which was a 3,000-core alpha server at Pittsburgh, the largest open science machine at the time. Uh, but part of the, uh, the commendation in this, in this award was that NAMD was actually a portable program that had run across a variety of different platforms over the years and had produced a fair amount of uh, useful science in the process. Uh, we have a large number of users, so we track all of our downloads. People register, and from that same account, they can download multiple times. So these are not downloads. These are actual uh, registrations, uh, 60,000, uh, 3,000 citations for the 1999 reference paper. Um, we were selected as a target application for uh, what was originally the NSF leadership class uh, sustained petascale supercomputer, which was eventually awarded to uh, the University of Illinois as the Blue Waters machine. Uh, this is sort of the facility where the current Blue Water system is housed under construction. And we were also uh, early adopters of GPU acceleration technology back in 2007. So uh, if you think NAMD is a popular code, this is our other product. Uh, this is VMD. Uh, VMD probably has five times the number of users that NAMD does easily. And in fact, it's not only used by everyone who uses NAMD as the visualization and system simulation preparation tool, uh, it is also used by virtually everyone who uses a competitor of NAMD. So if you are doing uh, biomolecular simulations, VMD is typically the tool of choice. And it actually gets used uh, in various other fields just because it's a very capable visualization tool. Uh, it runs uh, analysis, large-scale simulations. We'll have a little bit more about this later. But no, so these are the sort of the, the two main tools that we produce. Um, when we are asking the NIH to continue funding us so we can keep our jobs, we say things like this, uh, where we point out that, you know, NAMD has both a broad impact, so we have a large number of users, and we have scientifically significant results. Uh, we strive to produce uh, comprehensive industrial quality software um, so that this is code that is maintained by professionals, uh, code that works when you use it. Um, so NAMD particularly is, is integrated with the VMD software for simulation setup and analysis. Uh, it is extensible as we uh, can make it without impacting performance using the TCL scripting language. And if TCL is a relatively old style scripting language compared to Python, we'll note that it is also the primary scripting interface for VMD. So everyone who uses VMD knows a little bit of TCL, which makes the little bit of scripting they do in NAMD really uh, transfer quite well. And we try to provide a consistent user experience going all the way from a laptop all the way up to the largest supercomputers in the country. So we have all these users. Um, since we're funded by the NIH, we like to point out that 18% of them or so are actually funded by the NIH, according to self-reporting. And of course, many of the users are not in the US and are not eligible for NIH funding. Uh, we also can look at how many users have actually downloaded for example, NAMD 2.8 and NAMD 2.9, or a beta and a final release uh, to indicate that those users are not just coming in, trying one version and going away. They're actually 
uh, upgrading the software over time. So the other thing we like to talk about is that we can do these leading edge simulations. So we have a large number of users, but uh, if you look at the large machines in the US, we're one of the most used softwares at Oak Ridge and at Texas on those large machines, and we have science projects and we're an acceptance test for Blue Waters and an early science project for Blue Gene Q. Uh, we can also point to citations from external users. So again, we've had 3,000 citations since 2007. But in any case, we've got about uh, several thousand external citations uh, going back to the 2005 reference paper. That's right, we have 3,000 citations of our 2005 reference paper, uh, a couple highlighted here, including various publications in Nature. Now, what are people doing with Nandi? Uh, we try to talk about this as a kind of computational microscopy. Uh, we have atoms, very small biomolecular systems that are doing things that you cannot observe with a light or an X-ray microscope. You want to see them in action. You want to slow the action down, know where every molecule is. Uh, you can do that with simulation. So on the left, we have uh, the ribosome, which is nature's solution to reading DNA. And on the right, we have uh, man's solution to re reading DNA, at least proposed. Uh, this is a synthetic nanopore. We have a single strand of DNA going through it. And by detecting changes in ion flow or electromechanical properties, we would like to be able to determine the sequence of this DNA. Now, the one on the left has the additional advantage of not only reading the DNA, but also producing a protein in the process. But because of the scale and the repetition in the DNA and the proteins and the lipids that form these types of systems, we can use the same tool and the same methodology for both. And that methodology is relatively simple. Um, keep saying this is not rocket science until PPL actually started working on rocket simulations. Then it's really not rocket science. But this is a very simple, simple classical force field. Um, starting from the bottom, uh, this is Coulomb's law of electrostatics. This is a normal Leonard-Jones interaction. Uh, you introduce different species with different well depths and radii. And then all of the covalent bond effects are represented by very simple uh, spring models. So we have a distance, we have angles, we have torsional angles, and we have a polarity conservation term. We take this energy model and we simply plug it into uh, Newton's second law, F equals ma. So we take the gradient and then we discretize that. And because this is a liquid simulation, it's dense, Everything is vibrating at about the same rate. Uh, we use just a simple <coughs> fixed time step integrator, and then we can modify that to control the temperature and the pressure of the simulation. Okay, so this is what we want to do. Now we need to make it run large, make it run fast, which is where uh, the parallel programming lab comes in. So you saw uh, the talks about Charm++ uh, last week, so this is a pretty good sized research group comparable to uh, what we have over at the Beckman Institute um, in the new Siebel Center for Computer Science. And NAMDI is not the only program that uh, Charm++ enables. They have research in a variety of different uh, applications uh, with active collaborations. But of course, of these, NAMDI is the most popular code. So part of the role of NAMDI in the Charm++ universe is we're sort of proof that the tools that they're developing actually work, actually can be applied at scale uh, for production research on these large scale machines. Uh, so this collaboration goes back to uh, early in the NIH funding of the center back in 1992. Uh, for those of you who were not working on supercomputers in 1992, I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, and C++ was uh, new and very poorly understood uh, templates weren't quite around yet, and if you did use them, they weren't that reliable. Uh, no such thing as the standard template library, and much of the advice for C++ that was being purveyed was actually derived from using small talk objects. So all sorts of interesting definitions of iterators and how one should do your uh, containers. Charm++ was very new. Before then, there had been a C program known as the char kernel, parallel virtual machine, which you could take separate computers and use them to run one program. It's crazy. That was the popular programming paradigm, and that's what we chose the first time, uh, first version of AMBI. And MPI was this new standardization effort. Uh, Professor Calais had been arguing that MPI really should add uh, non-blocking collectives. MPI basic, 
people basically said, no, we don't need non-blocking collectives, so he went off and started Charm++ because clearly we, he wasn't going to be able to do the research he wanted to do in MPI. MPI3, non-blocking collectives. So again, this is a symbiotic relationship. Uh, PPL provides tools and expertise, but this is far from one direction. The NAMD development effort provides feedback and a realistic test case and use cases uh, that drive development of new tools and expertise within Charm++. High performance computing in 1994. Uh, this was the cluster that had been ordered just before I joined the group and, and was assembled. So these are 14 single processor HP workstations, HP 735. Uh, these were a big deal at the time. They were as fast as a Cray for certain codes, 128 megs of memory, and a super fast uh, optical network. And they were about $20,000 a piece. But uh, the competing proposal at the time was that we would give our money to NCSA. NCSA would purchase a connection machine five by pooling our money with other groups, and then we could apply for time on our own machine. So the grad students did a little bit of research and decided, uh, no, we're going to go this way. So. That was the target platform. Our first NAMD in 1994 was written in C++, which was, of course, crazy at the time. Uh, you would write in Fortran, maybe C. Uh, PVM, pretty conservative choice. Uh, we used a spatial decomposition, uh, which was new at the time. Um, and this new technology of having a message-driven execution. So you data arrives, then you take action based on what messages have arrived, what order things should happen. Uh, we used a long-range electrostatics method based on uh, fast multipoles called Depemta, uh, running at about 10,000 atoms and about 8,000, eight processors. And this was not a uh, standalone program either. There was a whole environment here. It was called uh, MD Scope. Back in 1994, we were very proud of this. Uh, so we had NAMD, uh, Dynamics and Workstation clusters, uh, we had just started the collaboration with PPL, as I said, and this was actually a student-led revolt. This was not the first code that uh, one of Professor Shulton's students had written, had written but the uh, current students decided it would be easier to write something new than to port that code to the workstation cluster. And in fact, the true origin of the acronym NAMD is uh, there was someone whose name started with A and it was not their code. So VMD, uh, Visual Molecular Dynamics, uh, was the visualization code that started out as something called VR Chem because this is about when the cave had shown up at uh, NCSA and it was decided, you know, seemed like a good thing to be able to have molecules in the cave so you could stand inside the molecule and turn your head and have all sorts of other issues like that. Um, the NIH staff actually told us, no, we already have a resource that's doing visualization. You don't have to do visualization. You stick to MD. Uh, we sort of ignored that because the existing codes didn't handle molecular dynamics trajectories very well. Um, and uh, this turned out to be the right decision. Uh, it had a scriptable interface uh, from the very start, so you would log in, type little commands. Eventually that was uh, converted to uh, TCL. Um, and then there were two competing design philosophies. So Andrew is on the left, uh, Bill is on the right. Uh, Andrew is, these are both, both, both still working in uh, different HPC related fields, but Andrew's philosophy was we take existing tools, we use TCL to wrap them, and Bill's philosophy was no, we really need to implement stuff ourselves, do a better job, have it more tightly integrated, and so there's a mix of these two philosophies in the code continuing to this day. Um, and then there was the third tool, MDCOM, which was a formal collaboration with NCSA so that we could steer these simulations interactively, and uh, that was eventually replaced with a simple raw sockets connection between NAMD and VMD that works much more simply. Uh, so as far as the interactive steering here, so what we have here, this is a little flock of birds magnetic tracker device, and we are pretending to steer the DNA or to steer the estrogen receptor onto the binding pocket of DNA while observing the system in three dimensions, despite the fact that nobody is wearing glasses in this picture. So this technology uh, had continued development for some time. Uh, eventually we switched to a haptic device and uh, in 2001, uh, this, anyone recognize this? Tommy Thompson, uh, at the time head of uh, Health and Human Services, which is the big agency of which the NIH is a very small part. So he came to visit and apparently at one point uh, the grad student was trying to show him what to do and he jerked the haptic device back out of his hand. 
So um, as far as actual scientific impact, uh, somewhat limited. It turns out that if people wanted to be dentists, they would have gone into dentistry. They really want the computer to do things and uh, be able to repeat stuff. But good idea, good for uh, some experimental work and some structured routine. Our long-term strategy, looking at what we wanted to do, was uh, the idea that, okay, what's going on in this field? What's going on in biology? Well, the sizes of the structures that are being solved through X-ray crystallography are expanding over time. And so the th sizes of the things that we want to simulate are expanding over time. So BPTI is a bovine pancreatic trypsin inhibitor. This is sort of the hydrogen atom of molecular dynamic simulations, one of the first crystal structures solved. Uh, this is a part of the estrogen receptor. The part that actually binds estrogen has been clipped off. And this is part of uh, ATP synthase. This is what turns uh, photosynthesis into uh, chemical energy, or it turns a proton gradient into chemical energy, and there is also a large part of this molecule, including an entire membrane, which has been removed. This is just the rotating part. So uh, to match this, of course, parallel computing was our answer. This is where we started in 1994, and this, we were right, computers got bigger all the way up to 3,000 processors in, processors in 2002 uh, going beyond. So one of the good things that uh, working with Professor Collet did, we have to take an isoscalability analysis of this. Uh, what parallelization approach will allow us to use these larger machines for the larger simulations? So uh, there were various methods that had been tried at the time. You know, parallel computing wasn't new. It's just that that was normally a shared memory machine, uh, X numbers of processors, whatnot. Uh, so people had done you know, replicated data where you put all the data for all the atoms and all the processors. And if you work out communication to computation, this goes up as P log P. So that's not particularly scalable. Uh, you can take the atom array and just sort of randomly partition that by atom index across the processors. Nearby atoms are not on the same processor, so you sort of have to do all the communication. Uh, that's order P. Uh, one of the better methods that worked pretty well at the time was what was called force decomposition. So if you imagine, you know, you want all the atoms to interact with all the atoms. Um, you think about the interactions between pairs of atoms as these little squares, and you, you decompose this force matrix. So you decompose the actual work across the processors. Communication to computation ratio down to square root of P, which is much better than you know, order P, but it's still not scalable. You can't use a larger machine to do a larger simulation. So the method that is scalable is spatial decomposition because we have a cutoff on these interaction distances. And so this is a pretty standard technique. We break the data up into these little cubes, and you only interact with your neighbors. The way this was mapped to the messenger of an execution model in term plus plus was we say, OK, instead of making each processor one of these cubes, we will put many of these cubes on each processor. Uh, so this is sort of a virtualization technology. Um, and then you know, if you looked at the code that controlled each of these, there was sort of a loop type structure. It was sort of message driven, but you do, you know, you would receive coordinates from your neighbors, and then you would do various calculations, and then you would send results back to your neighbors. And uh, this actually gave us a good communication to computation ratio, but uh, there weren't enough of these cubes to load balance very well. And it really limited the amount of parallelism that we could because you were limited to the number of cubes, and we very quickly wanted to run on more processors than cubes. So after looking at this for a while, and this was about the time that I started getting involved in the code, we decided, OK, this isn't working. We need to do a rewrite. Uh, we made some decisions. We came up with a new design. And we decided that rather than using PVM with sort of a side version of the code in Charm++ that we used for analysis using the projections tool, we would do everything in Charm++. Uh, we would use a couple of templates very carefully, uh, risky features in a new language. And uh, we would do a hybrid decomposition. So this was uh, 1999. And this was the first NAMD2 paper. And in this case, we keep the same decomposition of the data, but we break the actual interactions between atoms in these different cubes into these objects that we call compute objects. And then you're no longer communicating with your neighbors. You're sending data to the compute objects that require it. And the compute objects, when they receive the data that they need or when the data they need becomes available on a given node, they enqueue themselves, they execute, and we get this wonderful overlapping. So this is from our uh, Gordon Bell award-winning 
2002 paper at supercomputing. Um, so we have spatial decomposition and the work decomposition uh, broken up. So we have both, for example, the covalent bonded terms, the non-bonded terms, Leonard Jones and electrostatics, and then long-range electrostatics. Uh, we had parallelized using particle mesh Ewald, which is a fast Fourier transform-based method. So the primary communication is this big transpose. And the nice thing about message-driven execution is that the latency-sensitive PME transpose can be hidden behind uh, the larger amount of work associated with uh, the non-bonded calculation. So this works pretty well. So you saw the talk about Charm++ last week. I um, have to remember that this NAMD design was sort of started in 1997 using 1997 Charm++. And some of the new features, modern Charm++ is actually uh, inspired by NAMD, but we've never felt the need to go back and rewrite NAMD code using uh, all of the modern Charm++ features that are available. So uh, as far as much of the NAMD implementation is concerned, Charm++ is a parallel C++ with these data-driven objects. Uh, we make use of object groups, which is basically you can think of an object that is represented on every processor in the system. Uh, we use asynchronous method invocation, so you send a message to another prod to another object. Um, prioritization is very important. So um, for, for uh, efficient execution, uh, if you don't have priorities on your message, your simulation will complete, but things may not happen in the most efficient order. Uh, we use measurement-based load balancing, so we have these um, what do we use object groups for? Um, for a large part, first of all, uh, they are used for data that needs to be replicated across the entire system. So if we need to be able to send message, um, and then things that are not fully integrated as uh, Charm++ arrays. So if a patch on one message needs to send a message to a computer and another message, we have proxies. And we have a lot of the groups are what we call, refer to as managers. So the idea is that um, if I want to communicate with an object in another processor, I will communicate through one of these managers. So I could make a call into that manager. I say, hey, send this message to node whatever. On the other node, that pops up. And then that can be delivered to a specific object rather than having Charm++ manage all of the computes as separate Charm++ char objects that can receive messages themselves. Um, so for example, proxies, uh, rather than sending the same data to another patch, to all of the patches, or rather than having a patch send the same data to all of the computes on another node that require it, uh, we have a proxy for that data. And that lets us uh, optimize some parts of that communication. So um, for the most part, yeah, I mean, many of the objects are simply there to shuffle messages, or the, the groups are simply there to shuffle messages back and forth. Okay. So we have that. And uh, finally, the portable messaging layer. So um, Charm++ can be built on top of MPI, but it can also be built upon uh, lower level uh, network layers such as TCP, UDP, uh, IB verbs for InfiniBand, and uh, Eugenie for Cray, and uh, the various IBM layers for BlueGeneP, BlueGeneQ. Uh, one other thing, so we talk about this as a as a asynchronous message-driven code. Um, if that sounds a little bit like chaos, uh, in some cases it is. Uh, so at startup, which is where uh, bugs and memory out of memory conditions are most likely to show up. We actually use uh, well-defined startup phases. So uh, P0, processor 0, reads in the input data for a normal simulation. Um, and then we have these different phases in which we're sending data, we're building up objects, we're processing uh, data, data in the startup process across the entire simulation. And these are separated by something which is called quiescence detection. So quiescence detection is a mechanism in Charm++ that you can basically say, OK, I've started a bunch of stuff. Let me know when every message in the entire machine has been processed. 
And when that happens, you get a call back and then you can go on. So this way, rather than having to say, well, okay, I'm gonna send this message here and then that's gonna send five messages and eventually everything will be received and having to track that completion, which is some relatively new research in Charm++ is to be able to track completion of all the side effects of a given message. Uh, we just say, okay, I'm gonna send this message. This is gonna trigger stuff. Computations will happen. I need to know when everything is done. Just get back to me. Um, so we use quiescence detection for that very well. And then we print out timings and the different state on startup. So if something does hang for some reason, uh, you can narrow it down. So this is very useful when you have users. And they say, and, you know, and they say, well, it hangs. Okay, what startup phase does it hang in? Okay, that corresponds to uh, you know, building the, the atom index lookup table. So we can track that down. Um, so yeah, so that works very well. And it can also tell us, okay, we run out of memory. When do you run out of memory? What do I have to fix? Where does the bug start? So a little bit more about message priorities. Um, so again, when we are sending messages or we're in queuing work, uh, we're using this as charm plus plus messages, either between nodes or within the same node. Um, so we have to assign priorities to those messages based on what the critical path to the next time step is. So earlier time steps should be scheduled before work for following time steps. Uh, the different paid stages in the PME transpose for the fast Fourier transform, those get prioritized in order. And if you're doing a calculation that will need to res turn results off node, that happens higher priority than purely local calculations that don't need to go over the network. Now, the important thing is that as modular as you may try to make the code, and one of the advantages of Charm++ is that you can do this composition of different algorithms. Again, you can compose whatever you like, and it will finish, and it will interleave, but for maximum performance, you need to have all of these priorities for the different modules coordinated. Um, so this all happens in a single header file, and we can use the projections tool to confirm that performance limits we're seeing are or are not due to a misalignment of priorities, if there was a way to reshuffle the work to get it done faster. Back in 2006, things are going pretty well. So we have uh, machines at the time are, for example, the first XT3 at Pittsburgh, which was about, I want to say, 2,000 cores. Um, so we're scaling relatively modestly sized systems out to a significant fraction of the machine. Um, also, the TerraGrid is new, the grid is a big thing, uh, so we're doing some experimentation with uh, the Globus tools. So this was another collaboration with NCSA where we had one of our projects that was trying to uh, study uh, dehydrogenase or hydrogenase uh, enzymes. This is actually part of a renewable fuels syndrome. They wanted to study, okay, where does hydrogen diffuse in all of these different molecules? So they needed to do a large number of relatively sim similar simulations. We wanted to push those out, resources available at the time, have them run, ship results back, move things between tape. Uh, the Globus tools are relatively new, designed to enable this. So we got together with NCSA, we wrote a bunch of uh, scripts and software, and at the end of the day, uh, when we talked to the students, they were saying, well, you know, okay, when it all worked, uh, this took about 30% less work. I was about 30% more efficient than if I had managed this myself or sort of just written scripts, but that's after you get all of this code set up and uh, basically this software rotted very fast with New Virgins Globus and this uh, particular instance was never actually used again. And sort of one, one lesson that I took away from this is that okay, there are different parts of your job that you have to do as a scientist. Some of them are challenging and some of them are things that you have to do. And it is most important to relieve people of the intense intellectual effort. Uh, certain things like washing beakers and turning lights on and off when you leave the room and shuffling a little bit of data around, uh, this is not a great impediment to research. So given where we can push, put our efforts, um, we don't usually push them into uh, these types of grid technologies today. Other exciting things going on. So 2005, 2006, we're getting ready for another one of our five-year renewal proposals. And uh, we're looking at all sorts of exotic accelerator technologies. So if you think GPU computing is new, uh, it's really not. If you think, well, Mike and all this other stuff is, 
is a lot of variety. No, this has been going on for a while. Um, FPGAs were a serious contender. NCSA actually had what they called the, um, what was it? Innovative Technologies Lab. And so they were working with all these, the cell processor, people were doing computing on PlayStations. There was a company called ClearSpeed that had a low power uh, mini core processor. The Japanese had special purpose hardware. And uh, people were even coming up with this crazy idea that, well, if you used the GL shading language to program the GPU, you could actually get it to do math for you in addition to just putting up graphics. But it was sort of a pain to write. I think I managed to set some data and get it back off. Uh, so we put all this stuff together and NCSA put together uh, their proposal for Blue Waters. I went to supercomputing and NVIDIA is talking about something called CUDA. Um, and I sort of came back and said, you know, I think this is where things are going to go. This is how we're going to program GPUs. Uh, John Stone was the lead developer of VMD, still is. Uh, the GL graphics expert in the group said, yeah, this stuff comes up along all the time. Uh, then I was actually going into work one day and I ran into uh, Wen Mei Hu and the chief scientist from NVIDIA in the parking garage and they said, hey, we're teaching a CUDA programming course. And I said, hey, can I come? And they said, sure. And I said, John, you want to come? And he asked a lot of questions, and by the end of the course, he was lecture. Uh, we got very lucky, and you know, with a significant amount of preparation, uh, relatively early into the CUDA-based GPU computing. Again, 2006. Uh, this was our large simulation. So this was a million atom uh, virus simulation, the first simulation of an entire life form, depending on your definition of life form. And then we'd been working up to the ribosome, which was about 2.7 million atoms, and that was on an entire Cray XT3 uh, getting a certain level of performance with you know so many atoms per core. And the NSF comes out with the uh, sustained petascale computing environment proposal that eventually becomes Blue Waters. And uh, one of their acceptance tests says a NANDI simulation of 100 million atoms uh, with these various parameters at this live-in level of performance. Um, so it's like, okay, how much do we need to hit this level of performance? Uh, this is half, twice as fast as we're running now. How many cores is this machine going to have? So based on this, we started making some plans. NCSA submitted their proposal. Everyone submitted proposals. Uh, the contract was awarded to IBM for a wonderful looking on paper Power 7 system. Uh, and we started making plans to run in this Power 7 system, porting the code, optimizing. And uh, basically, OK, so what do we have to do? Well, this is our strategy, larger machines, larger simulations. Uh, so what can we do? Well, it's about the scale of something like the chromatophore. So uh, basically, we need to find you know, interesting scientific questions. We need to be able to build models of those uh, systems that we want to simulate, come up with the initial coordinates for the atoms, put the data somewhere, analyze the data somehow. And of course, do the simulations by getting NAMD up to that scale, both in terms of number of atoms and in terms of uh, the number of processors that we can use. So in 10, 2010, uh, we put in a PRAC uh, proposal, petascale resource allocation uh, simulation, saying, well, OK, we want to do the ribosome, which you saw earlier. This is a poliovirus. This is the uh, chromatophore, which is the light harvesting system. And this was the. Uh, bar domain vesicle that was actually called for in the NSF's uh, call for proposals. Um, OK, so we got this done. Uh, this came back. This was awarded. And then we said, OK, well, better get some hardware. Uh, and conveniently, there was a stimulus grants, uh, equipment grant program put out by the NIH. And this proposal really wrote itself because we said, well, we've got blue waters coming. We have an allocation on this. We need to do these very large simulations. So we're going to need a way to store the data and visualize the data. We need some equipment. So we said, OK, we need you know, uh, visualization workstations, about seven of those, uh, a bunch of disk space, uh, some clusters to analyze that data, and some high performance networking gear. And that was awarded, and we started getting all this simulation system set up. And we finally got the uh, 10 gigabit networking installed, I kid you not, a month ago. Uh, so this is all working, but we had all the, the visualization, the storage, and everything uh, working pretty well uh, right through the time that IBM was supposed to deliver the machine and didn't. Um, we also did a bunch of work on VMD to be able to support these large data sets. So we got it working. 
uh, with 20 million and 100 million atoms, made sure there weren't any order n squared calculations. Uh, John did a lot of work using uh, SSDs and SSD RAIDs where we can actually get four gigabytes per second from a RAID array onto the screen to visualize long trajectories of simulations um, and actually being able to do out of court perform calculations on these simulations. So we can do frames at a certain rate for these calculations. And since that's not enough, actually being able to use uh, the visualization code with MPI running on clusters on the GPU enabled nodes of Blue Waters. And this is all controlled through scripting language. So we can go through, we can run this stuff, do the analysis and data, gather the results in a format that the users can use it. So we've done all this work. Uh, NAMD, we had a pretty straightforward task. So the nice thing was they didn't ask us to do anything that was anticipated to be impossible. This was supposed to be a specification for what the machine could do. But we had sort of this order uh, and memory usage per node. So for small simulations up to that point, the amount of memory per node had always been increasing. That was proportional to what we could use to visualize and analyze the machines. And as simulations got larger, they also needed to run longer to get acceptable results. Uh, but at some point, the memory per node sort of started leveling off. So we had to fix the per node, node memory usage. Uh, we did that by exploiting the redundant structure in the system. So currently, for the structure files that we've been using, uh, every lipid, every protein would be represented as an individual set of atoms and bonds between those atoms and whatnot in the file. Uh, we were able to mine that and go through, load it on a large memory machine, identify the common elements, compress that down. Uh, all the per atom data, we just did distributed loading, uh, distributed distribution of the patches uh, to eliminate the bottleneck. And for this, we came up with a special memory optimized build, realizing that only a small fraction of the user community, albeit an important fraction, uh, would need the special requirement. And not all features are supported for these special memory optimized builds. Uh, this compression process uses a NAMD only file format. Uh, and what that means is that you build the normal, you have the normal version of NAMD and a large memory machine. You load the molecular system, it spits out this intermediate state. And then the memory optimized build very quickly can read in parallel that special uh, structural state file. Um, we reserve the right to change this between versions. And the reason for that is, well, currently it only supports certain features. Um, we may add certain things over time. We may come up with a better way to do this. We may optimize it. And I do not want to promise to maintain backwards compatibility. And for that reason, you also can't load these files into VND and look at them. Uh, this is only working between NAMD. As soon as we provide the ability to read these files in VMD, or as many people have suggested, well, why don't you have VMD do this compression for you? Uh, because as soon as we do that, in order to use a new version of NAMD with a new version of this file, not only do you have to build NAMD, which we assume you have if you want to use NAMD, you need to build a corresponding version of VMD. And building VMD is probably an order of magnitude more complex because of the number of libraries that it uses uh, relative to building NAMD. Because you know, building NAMD, we expect people to have to compile this on various supercomputers themselves. VMD, we ship binaries for Mac, Windows, Linux, and that pretty much covers the universe. I.O. performance, one of the reasons I've been around for a couple of days is I'm still uh, looking at I.O. performance and how various file systems work. Um, molecular dynamics is not a data intensive field. Uh, we sort of read in a certain amount of state at startup and then we trickle corresponding amounts of state back out as a trajectory file during the entire run, so we can over overlap that. So right now, we're just using a parallelized POSIX I.O. Uh, that solves the memory usage problem. Performance is OK. And we have a new uh, I.O. library in Charm++ that we are sort of co-developing uh, to try and improve this level of performance. Uh, the other main thing that we had to do was to take the load balancer, which had been centralized. And this is sort of one thing I've hope the Charm++ folks about is why are all the load balancers in Charm++ serial? Don't you have some sort of a nice parallel programming system you could use to distribute that? Uh, so we actually had to parallelize the load balancer. Um, and we've taken a very simple approach uh, where we basically 
split the system up into uh, different processor domains, and we load balance within those domains. The concept being that it is more important to eliminate the spikes and get everything balanced, and for a large system, relatively homogeneous, performance differences across those domains do not have a major significance. Performance impact and trying to fix them will likely introduce uh, severe additional communication, which may actually make things worse. So uh, for the simulations that we do, this works quite well. Other performance issues, getting scaling up to large systems. Um, eventually, the contract for Blue Waters was uh, re-awarded to Cray. And quite thankfully, we had been working with Oak Ridge National Lab to uh, port Charm++ and Namdi to uh, their Cray systems, and particularly the new uh, Gemini network on the Cray. So this performs significantly better than uh, the old C-Star network. And uh, we wanted to switch from MPI to uh, a lower level network. So again, Charm++ can access lower level network interfaces that are better support supported, suited to message-driven execution rather than re requiring all of the MPI semantics. Um, in Gemini, we see this case in particular, and this is particularly relevant for uh, when we're running in multi-threaded mode. So you can run Charm++ as a what they call an SMP port, where you have a communication thread and various worker threads, or you can run in non-SMP mode, where you have multiple processes on a node, and each process has its own communication driving loop whenever it goes idle or in between, uh, in between work elements, it will check pull the network. We get a big benefit for SMP mode and for these large simulations we'd shown in a uh, paper at SC11 that <clears throat> as the simulation gets larger, you can aggregate within a process, send fewer messages over the network. SMP mo node is definitely a win and particularly for uh, GPU calculations, we need to run in shared memory mode. So this was our paper at Supercomputing last year. And you can see there are two things I want to point out here. Uh, so we're plotting the number of cores here. And so you'll notice that at the bottom, the spread does not look like that big a deal. But uh, the transition from Jaguar to what we're calling Titan, in this case, um, went from, I think it was two six-core processors to a single 16-core processor. So the number of cores per node has gone up, and the performance per core has actually dropped. So this is running up to all the cores on the machine, and we get very good scaling for uh, the new code. If we use MPI, we see slower scaling, and if we use Jaguar, we can see that uh, we actually start out faster on fewer nodes, but it bails out eventually. Um, and then this was for the small subset of uh, GPUs on the machine. Now uh, we're doing much better. This is not quite the current uh, performance state of the code, but this was the last run that I did uh, before Blue Waters was taken down for reconfiguration and expansion. Uh, so this is the CPU nodes of Blue Waters, uh, GPUs on Titan, uh, the CPUs on Titan, and of course the CPUs on Titan scale very well. Uh, there are fewer of them using Blue Waters, trying to use all the co twice as many cores per node, plus uh, there are some performance issues on Blue Waters that are likely related to the uh, I.O. nodes and how, uh, how traffic travels to the I.O. nodes, and then our very own uh, Blue Gene Cube. So we're achieving very well scaling to complete petascale systems. Where are we now? So this is, this is all well and good, but again, we are an NIH-funded resource. Uh, we have to justify ourselves not merely that we can do these very large simulations, but by being a code that is accessible to the masses. So this is the uh, selling point for NAMD. Uh, basically, you know, we're trying to be what we call practical supercomputing. So we have this large number of users, and you know, I'm a little bit jealous because I'm, I'm looking at the LLVM talk, and you know, it's like, wow, and you've got all these contributions, and everyone's so good, and I'm realizing, you know, everyone who uses your code is a programmer not less the people who contribute to it. Uh, here we have people who are biologists, biophysicists, chemists, various, you know, various levels of science, and their motivation is to get science done, get their grants written, get their papers published, get their PhDs. Um, so we, we, we have sort of a, a limited uh, contribution, but they do want to develop new methods that are specifically for their things every now and then. 
Uh, so we have a large number of those. Um, we're providing one platform again. Virtually everything you can do with NAMD, you can do for small systems on your desktop and laptop. Uh, and then you can scale up to the local to a Linux cluster in your department, um, the Exceed supercomputers, or even the uh, Blue Waters or uh, Insight leadership scale machines. And in that process, you maintain all of the knowledge that you've learned. So you don't have to go and learn a new code now that you want to run at scale. You can just keep using NAMD as your science grows. We don't change the input or output file formats very much. And you can run any simulation, not with the same performance, not realistically, but in theory, if you have enough memory, on any number of cores. And of course, it's available free of charge to everyone. So you can use it. You go somewhere new. They will have access to it. Um, works pretty well. So some of the uh, details of how we distribute the code and license the code. Uh, we ship both binaries and source code. Uh, the source code includes a tarball of the Charm++ source. And uh, in particular, that, it, that is the Charm++ source code that is recommended for use with that current version of NAMD. There may be a couple of uh, NAMD-specific patches that are applied to that source code based on what uh, new features that NAMD is using. But in general, that reduces the number of combinations in the wild that we have to worry about, as opposed to before saying, hey, and you have to download Charm++. Well, when they download Charm++ may vary. Things may get fixed or broken in Charm++. By providing the Charm++ source code, we eliminate that variability. Uh, we do releases about once per year. Um, those are driven primarily by how stable is the code? Have we added enough new features that it's worthwhile? Have we increased the performance so that it's worthwhile for people to go through the work of upgrading? And in fact, if you're doing a simulation, you're running a particular version of the code, you're probably not going to want to change courses in midstream. You're going to want to keep running the simulation with the code that you've validated that you're getting the right results for rather than adding something in with the hopes of getting higher performance, for example. So we do that. Uh, we also provide nightly builds. So this is an automated process. You can download a Linux binary, a Linux CUDA binary. And the source code, including the Charm++ source code that it's built with every night, that is our primary uh, bug fix release mechanism. So if something doesn't work for you in the standard release version, and if we fixed it, you can get uh, the latest nightly build. Uh, when you download NAMD, we require you to register. We ask you ba basically, what's your name? Where, what's your institution? What's your email address? We never, we send out survey questions every now and then, every four or three years maybe. Um, and are you NIH funded? So we can report these statistics. Um, if you fill out a request form, we'll give you access to a public clone of our CVS version. So if you want to do development, you can up pull in updates directly through CVS. And then for the supercomputers that we have allocations on, which uh, includes most of the significant machines on Insight and on <coughs> the Exceed systems, um, I will make binaries available in my home directory, both for the users in our group and that the larger community can use. Uh, licensing terms, uh, no redistribution. So this is based on our funding model. We need to be able to demonstrate how many people are using the software. One way we show that is through downloads. If we let you take the NAMD and post it on your website, first of all, we can't push updates to that version. So we have no way of ensuring that our users get new update. And plus, we lose track of those users. Uh, so we require that. Uh, and technically, the license requires you to come to our website and register, even if you're using a version that's been installed someplace else, just so we can track you. Um, we require you to cite the software. Um, you can use it for any purpose. People ask about commercial licenses. Uh, in general, you can use it for pretty much anything. You just can't redistribute. It, um, our license mentions commercial use, but what we really mean there is reselling the software. Um, you can use it for what we call internal business purposes. So if you're working in a pharma company and you want to use NAMD to cure cancer, more power to you. That's what we're funded for. That's why I'm in this field. Um, one thing about the, the no, re no redistribution, uh, we're a little bit looser than your standard GPL license in this particular sense, in that you can take 10% of the source code from NAMD or 10% of the source code from VMD, and you can use that without restriction for anything you want 
as long as you're combining it with at least an equal amount of your own original source code. So what this means is if you want the force calculation routines in Nandi, you want some integration algorithm, you want some solver, you want all the CUDA kernels, for example, and you want to put those into your code for whatever reason, be our guest, that's fine. Uh, we only care about people cloning the full program NAMDI, the full program BMD. Steal all the source code that you like, up to 10%. Um, and then certain components, for example, VMD uses a plugin infrastructure for uh, molecular file readers and writers. Um, those use a BSD license. And a lot of that code, it's BSD license, first of all, because a lot of that code has been contributed by outsiders. Um, we also have a bunch of TCL plugins that are covered by that license that have been contributed. And those plugins are actually used by several other codes in the community uh, to provide translations with different formats. Uh, support and training, again, so this is part of our, what we're funded for by the National Institutes of Health is to provide you know, some support to this large community. Uh, we have a public mailing list. Um, my philosophy is that I started out doing these types of simulations, but I have not actually done a production simulation in 10 years. Uh, and that one I only really did because I needed it to finish my dissertation. Um, so you're better off talking to other scientists. In particular, you're better off asking a question to a large group of other scientists who may have encountered the same uh, problem that you have. Um, this lets me focus on other things. Um, the mailing list is, of course, archived, searchable. And one of the nice things I like about having people ask their questions in public is that certain social conventions apply. Um, nobody is being asked to keep secrets. Uh, people feel a certain amount of responsibility to try things on their own rather than just asking the most convenient person available. We have an email address that we try to reserve uh, for bug reports um, for the most part. So if you think something is not working, please put together a test case, do these tests, send it to the uh, email address, and we'll look at it. And then for particular driving projects and people who are exercising or developing new capabilities in the code, um, in those cases, I'm happy to provide personal support and feedback to that small number of projects. Um, training, we have a variety of tutorials and case studies, and this is something that we actually are able to employ the graduate students in the resource to do. So we have actual scientists doing actual simulations, writing the tutorials. So, And that's much better than having me write something, because I know what the internals of the code look like. There are certain things that I understand that I'm not going to be able to explain as well as someone who actually uses the code has gone through this learning process themselves. And these tutorials focus on particular science use cases, on particular science problems. So how do you study channels? And then we have a series of hands-on workshop. We will, again, these are taught by uh, Professor Shulton, <coughs> Professor Tash Gorshid, the PIs of the group, um, with various graduate students as uh, teaching assistants, several per year. And we'll have one of them locally, and we'll have a couple of them hosted around. So for example, we're trying to arrange one possibly next year out at Oak Ridge. And these workshops work very well you c because the samples have all been scaled down so that you can run them on a laptop. And that works much better than giving people you know, access to a computer lab or access to a supercomputer that gets yanked back the minute they like the workshop. They do everything on their laptop. A, they learn how to use the tools on their laptop. The tools are there beforehand so they can get a little bit of practice before they show up. And everything is available after the workshop so they can continue working. OK, how do we promote the code? Advertising. Um, this is the kind of ad that I like to see. So this is actually our uh, HIV capsid simulation that was done during the friendly user period on Blue Waters. And visualization using VMD, 64 million atoms. Occlusion-based rendering using uh, John's own ray tracer that was his uh, thesis project when he was a grad student. Um, and basically, the way I prefer to promote Nandi is not to go and lay out performance curves and say, hey, you can do this and this and this technical feature. I want to demonstrate the science that can be done with the code. And if you're a scientist and you ask me, should I use Nandi, I say, well, I think you should use the code that people who are doing the kind of science you want to do use. And particularly, I, we get requests for, um, hey, I'm doing this material science thing. Would this be useful? Like, well, we're funded by the NIH. We really can't risk that grant running around 
you know, trying to support every field in the world, you should use whatever code people in your field tend to use. So we try and demonstrate the science that can be done. If you look at the NAMBI web pipes, we have a bunch of highlights um, of simulations that have been done with NAMBI. It's also important when we do get sort of a coup like this that people who contributed to the effort are able to share the credit. So, and particularly when this story came out, um, you know, NCSA was very excited because this was real science coming off blue waters. The NSF was happy. Uh, we try to give the Department of Energy some credit because, again, their machines are, and our experiences on their machines are the reason that we're able to make good use of blue waters today. Um, NVIDIA, because we use GPUs in it. Of course, uh, the Parallel Programming Lab on the computer science side, they get their publications. And then, of course, um, all the collaborators on this type of work. Over these 20 years, you know, I'm, I'm sort of one of these 40-something crotchety programmers who hates change, with good reason. A little bit of the philosophy and development process that I've sort of worked out over the years. Um, so we have this five-year funding cycle. We've been through it several times uh, very successfully. Um, so we sort of have this period in which we have to, you know, have, have the code ready to have the science done and published and then come up with new ideas and new pilot projects for the new proposal. So what you generally do with a five-year funding cycle like this is anything big that you want to do, you need to start early in the, in the funding cycle uh, so that that can fail or work out or be tried multiple times until it does work. And then later on, you can do the shorter range, lower risk activities. And then finally, as you come up near the, near the proposal, you can do the uh, unfinished preliminary work to go into the next proposal to say what you're going to be able to do. We use what is uh, an evolutionary development model. So we've had the one big rewrite. And even for that, a lot of the code from the previous version of AMD actually survived and is still in use. My philosophy is that any complex system that works has evolved from a simpler system, which also worked. So we want NAMBI to be functioning fully at all times. So there's no checking broken things into the revision control system and fixing them later. Everything should work. Um, we don't have a stable branch and a development branch. Charm++ does. And that was a great advantage for us because they actually have bug fixes that they can push into the stable branch that don't pollute us. Um, so we build off of the stable branch until there's a feature that we need or they're getting ready and they have uh, release candidates. But we don't push bug fixes back to the stable releases. When we have a release, we try to have everything working in that release. And if we fix something later, that goes into the nightly builds. And for the few people who encounter that bug, they can use the nightly build and it should be functional. Um, if we have to do large changes, we try to do that by refactoring. So you figure out what state you want the code to get to, and you make small changes that keep the code working along the way until you get there, rather than try and pull out a lot of stuff, write a whole design, get a whole bunch of new code in, and hope it works. So small changes, evolution. Um, I like to simplify rather than manage complexity. So we have a relatively small development team. Um, there's myself, one other person who is primarily working on the uh, molecular dynamics fit flexible fitting methods, which are for analyzing cryo-electron microscopy code. Uh, we had another developer who was doing more of the methods-oriented work. And then we have people in Charm Plus, the Charm++ Plus Plus team who are working on different projects. And then we will have occasionally students working on particular application areas. So. I try to work that out. What I found out is that the best way to get something done is if the person who is working on the program, working on the feature, needs the feature for something. That ensures that the feature works, the feature gets done, um, and other priorities don't come on. Other than that, we try to reduce the amount of coupling between the different codes. So particularly NAMD and VMD, we have these file formats that we interchange. We don't have a lot of crossover between those two codes. Um, as far as development goes, um, I am loath to develop new features that do not have not just someone who says that they want to use that feature, but someone who is eager to use that feature, who can help to beta test it, who can provide early feedback, who can show that it works. And ideally, when we have the first feature deployed in NAMD, we also have a paper demonstrating the use of that feature. So the HIV was a very good point. You know, We're developing these very large simulations. It's great to have someone who is urgently using those large simulations for important science. 
that tells us where our priorities are. Uh, that set up, I will also not put a feature into Nandi that I believe will be only be useful for a single project. So if you would like to take Nandi and hack it to do something for your particular code feature, that's fine. But if this is highly specialized, it's not going to go into the mainline branch. You graduate, you'll probably not even keep using it. No schedules, no promises. One other thing that I've learned is that, you know, it's nice to make plans and say yes, and we'll have this done by here and this done by here. Uh, but as they say, this is research. You know, we don't actually know what we're doing. We don't have a good gas grasp of how long it will take, and we don't know what our priorities are going to be next week necessarily. So we have plans. We have things that we want to do. Um, I try not to start anything until I'm rel relatively sure that I'm going to be able to finish it in a short period of time. And I also don't try not to make promises. So people will ask, when's the next release coming out? It's like, well, really don't want to say it'll come out when it's ready. Things will happen. Um, and I've gotten progressively better at trying not to make promises because whenever I say, yeah, it'll be out in a month, there may or may not be something else. And I don't want to release buggy code as a standard release just because I had a deadline to get it out. Um, we really don't have documentation for the design process or the code itself. Um, I prefer to put that effort in making sure that the source code itself is what I call discoverable. So if you walked into a building and someone handed you a map and said, here, this map will help you get around the building, you would conclude that's not a very well-designed building. I should be able to walk around the building, see designs, observe the design language in the building, find the staircases uh, without having to have you know, the entire plans of the building to tell me how, it, how to do things. Um, for some feature development where we expect there to be a variety of uh, new features added, we'll provide sandboxes that try and hide some of the complexity of the parallel runtime so that people can focus on that particular method. But in general, good design, good nomenclature, some you know, explanation, but basically try to make the design discoverable. Um, then as far as our priorities go, um, we're driven by we want to enable new science, uh, so that depends on what the driving projects are. And if someone is contributing their own blood, sweat, and tears to improve Nandi, um, they will have a very high priority as far as where my time goes. So if, for example, we have uh, someone inside Intel working on the mic port, uh, when he comes up with something, I'm willing to put time into that. We have. Uh, former graduate, another former graduate student from PPL at IBM who works on the uh, on the uh, blue gene machines. Um, anything that they need tends to be pretty high priority. On the other hand, they tend to be pretty uh, independent. Okay, so again, priorities, opportunities, and when someone says we need to simulate the AIDS virus, that goes to the top of the list. So. Uh, the way this grant works with the National Institutes of Health, we've got this software we want to develop. Uh, we also have experimental collaborations. Those provide driving projects. So in this case, uh, we have, for example, the ribosome all the way up to different viruses. Uh, so we have these different collaborations. The way those work is um, most of those collaborations rely in some way on NAMD. Uh, some of them are high-end. They're pushing scaling efforts. Others of them are driving different feature development. So they need different things. So when someone walks in and says, OK, I need to be able to do X, well, we sort of say, OK, well, what do you really want to do? So you don't necessarily need that feature. Tell me what your goal is. Maybe there's a way to do that using what we have now so you can get started. Um, if not, is there a scalable way that we can do it? F make sure that we can do this in something that will be appropriate for large scale simulations, and then try to make it as general purpose as, prob as possible so that the next time a similar simulation comes up, we'll be able to use it. We'll be able to use it in other driving projects. People out in the world will be able to use it. So one particular example that we're proud of is we have, I mentioned the uh, TCL scripting language in both uh, NAMD and VMD. So when you write your customization in TCL, uh, you end up with something that is portable. So you can test it on your laptop, and you can move it to Blue Waters, and it will probably still work. Um, so this can be used for a variety of things. So you can write top-level protocols. So the entire uh, NAMD input file, text-based input file, is uh, interpreted by TCL. So you can write little scripts. We say set 
temperature equals 300, write little loops, do simulated annealing. Uh, we actually implemented an entire replica exchange strategy uh, using TCL's sockets layer, uh, which worked. Worked is a little more on that later. Um, you can apply long range forces to small number of atoms. So if you need to steer something, stretch something, uh, you can write those particular types of forces in TCL. Uh, you can control free energy calculations. Um, and then you can even apply forces to all the atoms in the simulation. So what we're looking at here is uh, this is a virtual pore. So I showed you that nanopore with DNA. Well, if you want to study different pore sizes and how that affects the DNA, uh, this is just forces that replicate the position of a pore. So I mentioned replica exchange, uh, NAMD 2.9. One evolution that we had was uh, we went from this TCL socket space model actually into the MPI layer of Charm++, and I added a small number of MPI send, MPI receive type, MPI barrier type calculations using MPI com split uh, to be able to run multiple NAMD instances within the same master MPI process in order to do these replica exchange calculations. And this lets us do a variety of projects. It's all controlled by TCL on the front end. The scripts are designed to be customized. So if you want to do something new, uh, for example, we start out with, uh, this is classical parallel tempering. We have simulations running at different temperatures, exchanging based on their energy. But I also did a very simple uh, umbrella sampling conformational free energy calculation, gave it to a grad student, and as usually the case with good grad students, you don't hear back from them for a while until they show up with something that's really cool. And he went and used uh, we have this whole collective variable steering module for free energy calculations. He's using quaternion-based order parameters to force the opening and closing of this uh, transporter channel, 12 replicas sampling effectively on the entire replica path. I handed this off to uh, Benoit Roux at Argonne and the University of Chicago uh, with some basic 2D umbrella sampling, and they're doing uh, both uh, alchemical free energy calculations, so we have a left hand and a right hand, and the question is, if there's an ion in both the left hand and the right hand, how does that affect the free energy? And uh, also some larger simulations that they have an inside award for. And so we had this feature for uh, 2009 based on MPI. You'll remember that we had to do all this work to get uh, the Eugenie layer working on the Cray systems because we did not have good scaling for MPI. So we actually had uh, some funding from the Blue Waters project uh, to do a more general implementation. So we moved from the MPI machine layer in Charm++ to what's called their low-level runtime system, and that's underlying MPI and the Cray and the Blue Gene Q machines, which now lets us do these replica exchange simulations on a large number of machines. We can also, rather than simply exchanging messages in MPI style, we can inject these messages into uh, Charm++ calculations so we can get out of TCL and down into the grits of the program. And this lets us scale uh, something like the ribosome. So this is a relatively small simulation. You actually just want to simulate some protein folding um, at the exit domain of the ribosome. And we were actually, uh, this project was kicked off of Blue Waters uh, from our allocation because they said, you know, this is too small, this is not a petascale simulation. With the new replica exchange code, uh, the green code on the bottom, we have a relatively small simulation scaling uh, to basically all of Titan. So again, uh, thank you very much. And of course, thank you to everyone who has contributed in various ways to NAMD over the years. I'll be happy to answer any final questions. Thank you very much.